morning, everybody. Um, the, I thought I would talk about what is the problem we must solve. Uh, this is uh, basically a, a proposition that was put to me by Michel Cantal Dupar, who is an urbanist in Paris. I was at a conference called Colloque de Triville in 1993, which was a meeting of three cities in Paris called by the Ministry of Health. And there were people from New York, Paris, and London talking about AIDS, homelessness, and drug abuse. The, Michel Cantal Dupar took the stage, and he said this. For a long time, I've been trying to mobilize our leaders so that the city, the cities where our money and brain power concentrate, innovate for better functioning. What is the problem we must solve? It is the fracture that exists between the wealthy neighborhoods and the others. But paradoxically, if we want to improve, improve life in those neighborhoods, we can't just treat the neighborhoods. We must treat the whole city. We must eliminate the fracture. I'm trained in family therapy, and so this, this idea that you don't just look at the problem child is, is really fundamental to family therapy. The, the core idea of family therapy is the parents bring in the toddler who won't sleep at night, but the real problem is always the parent's marriage. So, you just forget the child. The child, the child does fine as soon as you, the couple starts talking to each other. Um, so this idea that, that, you, that the, the identified patient is not really where the problem is. So the poor neighborhood is always identified as the patient. The black people are identified as the patient. The Hispanic people are identified the poor are the patient. But really the problem is society, which is fractured, so that the resources of society don't flow to all groups in the society. I grew up in Orange, New Jersey, which is near here. And so for those of you from the area, you've perhaps been to Orange. Um, and this is a, an un, a map that probably most people in the audience have not seen before. This is um, a redlining map. And I always thought, because it said red line, that there was a red line on the map. But it turns out there's no red line on the map that the whole city is divided by colors, and that what they did, this was made in 1939, is they sent surveyors out to find out, really quite literally, where the undesirable racial elements lived and where they were moving, if they happened to be encroaching on the desirable racial elements. And so they looked for the age of the housing and if you were an undesirable racial element or not. Undesirable racial elements at that time were blacks, Hispanics, Asians, Jews, foreign-born, anybody foreign-born. Um, so in Orange, New Jersey, this was the African-American community, all in red. This is largely um, Italian and other working class people. And then this is the wealthy Seven Oaks area. Um, Notice that where the rich white people live and where the you know, not quite as rich white people live are sort of in natural colors because they're natural people, right? So they're blue and green. And then the undesirable racial elements, they're obviously in unnatural colors, yellow and red, because they're not natural people. The, the frankness of these redlining maps in putting out the, the, the ideology of racism is extraordinary and it's not accidental that this is done in 1939 when there's the rise of Nazism and racial hatred in Europe. There was a great deal of racial hatred that was frankly expressed in the United States as well. The point of this map is that people were told not to invest their money in the red areas, not so much in the yellow areas, invest in the green and the blue. And this meant that poor people and black people and Italian people and Jewish people couldn't get mortgages and couldn't get insurance. And so their houses slowly fell apart. If I set you down blindfolded, knowing this, set you down blindfolded in Orange, New Jersey, and said, OK, look around and tell me what color. What color was this place in 1939? You could tell me. So that's me. I look about the same braid. But my shoes aren't as cute. Um, oh well. Um, and when I was growing up, there was legal school segregation. So this line, which should have come straight down Central Avenue, took a jog. I lived right over there. And the reason it took a jog is because there were some people, black people, who lived in this little enclave. 
across Central Avenue from the main black ghetto, and there were white people who lived here. So they, they made this going through the middle of the park so that the white people over here could go to the white school, and then the black people over here could go to the black school. And the way my parents got involved in organizing in Orange, New Jersey, was bringing this uh, to the attention of the state's commission against discrimination and eliminating this school gerrymander in 1958. But there are other things that fracture Orange, New have fractured Orange, New Jersey more recently besides redlining and segregation. One of them is 280. I'm sure all of us from New Jersey have driven on Route 280. It went right through East Orange, Orange, West Orange, other cities, and really an orange took out the heart of the city. Orange was established in 1806 really as a factory town because there was good water. It was thought to be a good place to make hats. It became a center of hat manufacturing. 4.2 million hats were made there in 1898. Um, but the last factory closed in 1997, and the last major employer, which was Orange Memorial Hospital, a very beloved hospital, closed in 2004 and sits there uh, quietly waiting, this hulk, big hulk, sort of lumbers over the city, waiting for new life, waiting to be repurposed. Meanwhile, all the jobs that used to exist in the city have gone elsewhere. And this whole deindustrialization has become a very powerful force tearing apart Orange, New Jersey, and every American city. And then there's also just disinvestment. This is the end stage of redlining, where redlining simply said, don't put money there. But if you don't put money into buildings constantly, as everyone here who owns any kind of home, you, you have to take care of it all the time. You have to fix the roof, and you have to, to have new windows, and you have to update the kitchen. You, the, everybody's nodding. You don't have any choice. You got to put money in all the time. If you can't get money and you can't keep your place up, it falls apart over time. And if it falls apart enough, then it becomes an empty lot. And so empty lots abound, but especially in that heart of Orange, which was um, also injured by the highway going through. So the double injury of the redlining and then the highway going through and deindustrialization. There were quite a number of industrial plants there. So people not having enough money because they don't have good jobs, highways, redlining, these things add up. This has torn a hole through the center of the city and broken it into two parts. So there's the south part where the wealthy people are, and then the north part, which is the more ordinary people, and they, they are not connected to each other anymore. This has um, catastrophic consequences for health because parts that aren't in physical contact and in social contact cannot work together. P so this issue of is, is the critically important shift that thinking about it at this higher level as the problem of the city, not the problem of the neighborhood. This is really saying that it is not the black people that have the problem. It is not they who are segregated, but we who are segregated, we who are fractured. And if you can begin to watch your own language, if I can begin to watch my own language, I certainly watch my students' language. Um, we can begin to locate the problem. But I want to give you two examples of how this works out to our detriment. Um, this is from a study my group did of response to AIDS in Alameda County. Alameda was right across the bay from San Francisco where there was a massive AIDS epidemic and no plan. It's good to hear that Jen Velez, although she can't be here today, is trying to get together a plan for Ebola. So you need a plan. What you're supposed to do in public health is act right away. So see this big arrow? They were supposed to make a plan and implement it the first time they heard about AIDS. But they didn't. The government didn't act. And government didn't act because AIDS was a disease of homosexuals and intravenous drug users. And elected officials openly said, it's fine for them to die because that will rid the world of homosexuals. So we did not act. And so what happened is that groups, individual civil parts of civil society mobilized, but each of them has it embodies somebody's passion, somebody's wish to take care of some other group, but those are very particular. So there's a black organization which mobilized when the black people died, and there was a 
Hispanic organization that mobilized when somebody Hispanic died, and there was an Asian organization that mobilized when somebody Asian died. That is not the way to run an epidemic. An epidemic is not a tie. You don't pick it out of your closet and put it on because you like it. An epidemic is a threat to the body public. It's a threat to our ability to function. And because of this American response to AIDS, the epidemic continued to rise and went all over the world. The AIDS pandemic, which is so settled in, which we will live with for our entire lifetime, if not longer, um, is because of our absolute refusal to act for the whole society. Our, our idea that you can redline an epidemic. But how much does that graph look like this graph? So this is from the Centers for Disease Control. This is when societies were supposed to act on Ebola. We were supposed to act right away. If we had acted in the summer when the disease was very small, we would have contained it, the epidemic would be over by now, as Nigeria acted very aggressively to contain the epidemic. We didn't, and so we don't know exactly where it's going. This is from the Centers of Disease Control. But at its worst, we would, by January, have a million point two cases. That's not necessary. Sierra Leone, Guinea, and Liberia are poor West African countries that are marginalized in the scheme of things, and we were quite content to let them struggle with their own problem. We still have not sent, the world has not sent help on the scale at which it's needed. Now, epidemics can die out on their own. We don't know where this is gonna go, but we do know that however many people die of this epidemic, more than about 50 people, all of that are excess unnecessary deaths. And that, that is the problem. That is the real manifestation of a fractured society. Leslie's brilliant talk about the ACEs is so important because why do we have ACEs? Why do we have adverse experiences of childhood? We have adverse experiences of childhood because they're neglected children. There are children in a fractured society. You have a lot of children who aren't protected. 50% of the children in the United States and America are growing up in poverty. How are you gonna prevent ACEs if you aren't extremely vigilant and developing a new approach to how do we solve the fracture of our society? In my travels um, and opportunities to work with many urbanists, Michel Cantal Dupar in Paris and um, others in Pittsburgh and Roanoke and New Jersey, I abstracted from their work these um, elements of what I call elements of urban restoration, but it, it's what are the things that heal society? What, how do you heal a fractured society? And this is from my book, Urban Alchemy, Restoring Joy in America's Sorted Out Cities. Um, and I just want to talk to you about this first one that I got also from this idea from Cantel about the fracture, that you have to have the city in mind. People are focused on a neighborhood or a community or a group, but, which is fine. But if you are doing that, but you don't have the whole city in mind, you don't have the region in mind, you can't heal the fracture. The fracture is not inside a community. The fracture is between us. So how do we start? So this is element number one, keep the whole city in mind. Um, we start by going to see the city. So here's what I want you to do tomorrow. This, uh, go on Wikipedia, Wiki, uh, not Wikipedia, sorry. Go on Google Maps or whatever probably also in Wikipedia, and you can find the outline of your city or the city where you work, any city, doesn't matter. Take the outline of the city and go and try to find the, the look for fracture because fracture is not simply between people, it's also in the space. And there are some places that are conveniently completely homogeneous, like all rich people, all white people, all poor people, even within those places, there's variation. Go look and see what it is. But if you happen to live someplace where it's like all oh, rich people, there are a few places like that, Alpine, New Jersey, then look around. What are the other cities? Because sometimes cities are fractured from other cities. So look for the kinds of things that cause fracture. Uh, Deindustrialization is very common. Disinvestment, highways. Um, but also look for the kinds of things that are going on that express people's hope 
So these are our colleagues of mine in the University of Orange, and they, you can't quite see it because the lights are dim, but they happen to all be jumping up and down in mud because they're making an earth oven, an outdoor earth oven, so that we can have pizza outside. There are amazing things to see in cities, and cities, as Michelle Cantal Dupar pointed out, cities is where our money is invested. Cities are, generate ideas. Cities, even the smallest city, are incredibly important to our future. But we have to fix this fracture in cities. As opposed to fixing the fracture, we're in a moment in the American city where we are actually, through processes like gentrification, extruding the poor into the suburbs. Vicious things are going on that whatever our attempts to get poverty under control or ACEs under control or re dealing with trauma under control undermine all of those efforts. It's like quicksand. If you're displacing people, you can't get the stability you need to make forward progress. So go see what's going on in a new way. Take a bigger picture of your city and think about fracture. If we go into a disaster, unite it and connect it, the chances that we'll come out in good shape go way up. But if we go into a disaster divided and unwilling to look at each other's humanity, we will really suffer. <laughs>